This is CBC Here and Now. It's huge. I mean, you're, you're looking at an economic impact in, in the range of $120 million. Making the costly pitch to host the 2025 Canada Summer Games. Start cutting spending and, and cut it dramatically. Telling it like it is, what can we learn from Saskatchewan as it climbed back from the brink of financial collapse in the 90s? And the seagull actually got the bag off his leg and flew away, which was great. And just ahead, the tail of a plastic bag, a seagull, and an eagle at Kitty Vitty Lake. Carolyn has this amazing story when she speaks with the photographer who caught the entire drama. Good evening. St. John's is making a bid for the 2025 Canada Summer Games. They were supposed to be hosted here next year, but the province just wasn't ready. This will be the first time Newfoundland and Labrador has played host since 1977, but it's not going to come cheap. Here now as Jeremy Eaton explains. We'll have Jeremy's uh, item in just a moment. My apologies for that, but we will get to that. We're going to move on to some different news now about Muskrat Falls, and it's quite sobering. And it means that Stan Marshall's plans to step down as Nalcor CEO in April, well, those are now on hold. Marshall hosted reporters at Nalcor headquarters this afternoon, and it was hard to find anything positive in what he had to say. The complex computer software needed to operate the new transmission line from Labrador to the Avalon Peninsula is again delayed by at least two months. Testing has been suspended because of the number of software glitches. First power from the first of four turbines is also delayed. That's now scheduled for next month. The latest in a series of missed milestones. And technicians continue to struggle with repairs to the three synchronous condensers at Soldier's Pond. Those are needed to keep the grid stable during its operations. I think we have finished strong. The front structure is finished. Unfortunately, I say you're looking at the software, which when it comes to these, these final three components, they're manufacturer suppliers, and you have very little control over them. It's like when you go buy your vehicle, a new vehicle. You buy the vehicle, and if there's something wrong with it, you take it back to the dealer to get it fixed. He doesn't charge you extra for that, hopefully. It's his problem. They've got to fix it. It's their cost. Now, despite these setbacks, Marshall is sticking with his cost estimate of $12.7 billion. The cost is still within the, the uh, my last update. I mean, the contingencies are being drawn down, but the project's coming, crossing, finishing as well. So that's what normal cost would expect. So unless something unusual happens, well, I won't be giving another cost update. Now, on account of all this, Marshall says Premier Dwight Ball has asked him to stay on the job for another few months. But Marshall remains confident that Muskrat will be fully operational by the end of this year and delivering full power by next spring. All right, now we're going to get to that story about St. John's trying to make a bid for the 2025 Games. Here's Jeremy Eaton. It's a pretty big deal. It's probably a highest level a lot of athletes get to at this age. 15-year-old Abby Sheriffs was one of the many young athletes at the bid launch today in St. John's. If the Canada Games comes to her hometown, the Beaconsville basketball player will be too old to compete. But she and her teammate Olivia James hope to make the provincial team in time for 2021. Well, to be able to go away in 2021, I'd probably work the hardest I've ever worked to be able to go up and show what Newfoundland can really do. But it's not cheap. While the federal government will kick in some of the cost, Premier Dwight Ball says the province's share will be at least $10 million. Despite hard economic times in the province, the Premier feels it's a worthwhile investment. The games itself is around 45 to $50 million, but when you look at the, uh, the economic benefit that comes from that just through the games itself, so you know around $100 million, but then it's a lasting legacy that will come because we're now positioned to attract national and international events for the province. One hundred million dollars in estimated economic spin-off. Newfoundland's gold medalist Blair Tucker. It's been a long time since the city played host. By the time the 2025 games roll around, the pool built for the 77 games will be nearly 50 years old. You know, there's some work on, uh, on uh, the Aqua Arena and, uh, and a track. Uh, to name two uh, made, uh, pretty big facilities that, uh, that need to be upgraded or, or replaced. 
Joining the bid team will be basketball star and Canada Games alumni Carl English. He says work needs to start now to get infrastructure ready for 2025. It's not time to invest in three years' time because these athletes need to train and be prepared. Um, I want to say we won one medal at 2017, so I think we have to... We have to put our best foot forward, especially when we're at home. We'll have our home crowd, our home fans, our home cooking. With the bid submitted, there will be a technical review due in May of this year before a comprehensive community review in December. If successful, the Games will get the go-ahead in February of 2021. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Hopefully you enjoyed all of that sunshine and warm spring-like temperatures today because there's a little bit of white stuff on the way as we head through the rest of the week. Potentially some snow for eastern Newfoundland tomorrow. We'll talk about that a little bit. It's going to be quiet for the big land. You're looking at some sunshine, some flurries along the coast. And then the next weather maker will move in for Thursday and Friday. This one looks like it'll bring some accumulating snow. I'll have all those details coming up. Well, he's not playing to sink the eight, he's playing to slay the audience. This trick shot pool artist is sharing some of his amazing shots. They are amazing. That's ahead. To other news now, a crackdown on drugs trafficking in Grand Falls, Windsor has produced multiple arrests and charges. Police are calling it Project Barbarian, and they say they are targeting drug trafficking with links to organized crime. Multiple people were arrested on Saturday, including some at this Outlaws Motorcycle Clubhouse in Grand Falls, Windsor. Three people appeared in court Monday for charges of trafficking cocaine. Police will release more information on this operation tomorrow morning. A man who was just acquitted of murder in St. John's was on the receiving end of questionable police tactics. With Philip Butler's trial now over, a previously unreleased court decision was made public yesterday and it shows Butler was held in an interview room for several hours while he demanded to see a doctor. Here now is Ryan Cook reports. Eighteen times Philip Butler asked for police to end the interview. On six different occasions he asked or demanded to see a doctor. Despite that, his police interview continued on the night of his arrest for the killing of his brother George. Justice Valerie Marshall ruled the entire interview was inadmissible at his trial. Butler insisted from the beginning of the interview that he was a victim, that he acted out of self-defense, and that he needed medical attention. Butler was stabbed with a needle during the fight with his brother George. He told police George had hepatitis C. He also said he was hit over the head with a metal pipe and was experiencing chest pains. He laid on the floor wrapped in a blanket throughout most of the interview, which ran from midnight to just before 5 a.m. Paramedics were called after three hours, but by then Butler was agitated and refused to go to the hospital. Marshall says the tactics used by police were akin to a quid pro quo. Tell us why you killed George and we'll get you a doctor. On Saturday, a jury found Butler not guilty of second-degree murder. It's unclear if any of this would have made any difference since from the beginning of the interview Philip Butler claimed that he acted in self-defense and in the end the jury did find him not guilty. With the release of this decision we're expecting this to be the end of the road for this case. Surely a welcome finish for Philip Butler. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. To an update now on a CBC Investigate story we first brought you last year. A Paradise man who ran a failed headstone company has now been charged with defrauding two of his customers. Here now is Jen White has the details. William Kenny's case was called here at Provincial Court this morning. The 41-year-old was charged earlier this month with two counts of fraud over $5,000 for allegedly defrauding Fanny and Perry Langmead and Roy Cal back in 2018. Last year, a CBC News investigation found that Kenny was allegedly taking money from clients for headstones they never received. At the time, he was running W.D. Kenny Granite Company in Mount Pearl. Last year, the Langmeads and Cal both won their small claims lawsuits against the company. W.D. Kenny Granite later went into receivership and was forced into bankruptcy. Kenny is also facing another charge for making harassing phone calls to Roy Cal last fall. Both matters are due back in court in April. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. To healthcare now, some good news for patients who paid for cataract surgery. The province wants to reimburse you. According to the health minister, the move means the province will save more than $60,000 in federal transfers. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. 
The province is looking to contact a very specific group of patients, those who had cataract surgery in a private clinic more than two years ago and paid for it out of pocket. We're asking for people who had cataract surgery performed outside a regional health authority facility prior to June of 2018 uh, to identify themselves to the department because they may be eligible for re reimbursement. Those patients may be repaid as much as $1,100 each. The province is taking care of them and because charging patients for a publicly insured service violates the Federal Canada Health Act, it's also covering its own assets. The importance to us is that we have to report this to Health Canada uh, under the Canada Health Act and if people have paid out of pocket for an insured service, we, uh, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, get that money deducted dollar for dollar on our next year's health transfer. The province says it knows of about 60 cases and at $557 per eye, that could cost the province nearly $67,000 in federal transfers. The previous Minister of Health, the Federal Minister, was very keen on, uh, on enforcing it but also giving provinces an opportunity to rectify the situations. Provincial regulations were changed in 2018 to let private clinics perform cataract surgeries and bill MCP for them. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. An inquiry into the Humber Valley paving scandal is not going to happen. The Provincial Justice Department confirmed that it is not pursuing it because, quote, given the passage of time and other commitments, there doesn't seem to be much of a point. The scandal in 2014 and 2015 forced Nick McGraw to resign from his provincial cabinet post. McGraw was transportation minister when the decision was made to terminate a $19 million contract with Humber Valley Paving for road work in Labrador without calling in a $9.5 million bond against the company for being behind schedule. The government faced accusations at the time that it was playing favorites. Frank Coleman, the man who was about to become PC party leader at the time, had at one time been the owner of Humber Valley Paving. The city of St. John's is still dealing with the aftermath of January's blizzard and the state of emergency that followed. It's still trying to blow back snow and widen some roads. The city has now decided to get some outside help. Several contracts have been granted to local companies to provide snow blowing equipment for a total of $800,000. They were awarded without the usual tender process. The mayor says that's because it's necessary work and time is a factor. Danny Breen says that amount is included in the snow removal budget, which is estimated to be about four or five million dollars over budget. Carolyn. Thanks, Anthony. While many bars have a pool table, only one in this province has a trick shot artist from Las Vegas chalking up his cue. This week, Florian Venom Kohler will be popping up along the Avalon. He's in CBS tonight, Bay Roberts tomorrow, and he has more shows set for Mount Pearl and Torbay. Here now, Zach Gowdy caught up with Venom and wound up getting in on the act. My name is Florian Kohler, I'm also known as Venom, and I'm a professional pool trick shot artist. I'm originally from France, but I now live in the USA where I basically do that full time. This is what we call the egg shots. I'm gonna shoot the egg into the cue ball, cue ball's gonna go in the corner, and then the egg is gonna spin so quick it's gonna raise on its side. There's a few ways to go around and, and create new trick shots. So it, it starts mostly usually from a base, and it means you know you take an old shot and you kinda modify it, you kind of revamp it, you make it more modern or you make something more complicated. And then there's the other side that we just got to come up with it. It comes from my brain and I don't know how to explain it, it's just a weird, it's sort of like an artist, you know. Take like a blank piece of paper and some people are pretty good at drawing something new on it and that's sort of the same thing I have. The audience is very important simply because if you don't have an audience that's actually responsive, that makes your job very much difficult. The idea behind Trickshot is to make it a, an entertainment. How much overlap is there between trick shot pool and competition pool, eight ball or snooker? There's as much parallel, I'd say, as a, as a guy that does, you know, a backflip on a BMX and a guy that runs the Tour de France, you know what I mean? It's, it's a very, 
it's the same sport, but at the same time, it's not the same thing at all. So obviously, you know, the skills, meaning, you know, you got to ride a bike, meaning you got to run a table. So obviously, I can run a table, I can make balls, I can play position, you know, I, I'll do a break and run, no problem. But, you know, the mental aspect of it, it's a very different game because, well, the guy on his bike is just going to, you know, go as fast as possible. On my case, I got to find a way to make it as cool as possible in between point A to point B. If people want to see you on this tour of Eastern Newfoundland, how can they get the info? The best way you guys can find us for show is to check out the Facebook page, CPL NL East Pool League. Uh, you're going to have all the info there and uh, find out how to get tickets. You also really get the audience involved in your show, hey? The key is about to get as many people involved during the show and really have them participate and, you know, to make it really interesting and fun. It also adds a little degree of danger, I'll say, and uh, I feel like I got to get the man behind the camera today. What are you, me? Like, yeah, yeah. Fair? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think you're, uh, you're about to get in a little danger zone here. Okay, how does this work? So you're gonna put your feet in between the queue here. Okay. All right, yep. okay. Now I want you to hold the shoe like this, okay? Like? Yeah. I would have worn my jock. Okay, you're gonna have to move a little bit this way. Yeah, oh, not too much. I'm trusting you, Venom, all right? I'm trusting you. Then you shouldn't. Ready? That's amazing. Well done. Well done. Should we get the hair? <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> Can I have my shoe back? <laughs> oh my. I'm surprised that Zach's voice wasn't a little higher at the end of that. Uh, moving on. The man of a thousand songs is getting inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. A special ceremony will honor the life and work of Ron Hines. It's going to happen during the East Coast Music Awards, which takes place here in St. John's on April the 30th. For decades, the singer-songwriter from Fairyland wrote about hope and heartbreak with songs such as Sonny's Dream and Atlantic Blue. Hines was battling cancer when he died in 2015 at the age of 64. And today, his nephew, actor and writer Joel Thomas Hines, said his uncle is, quote, grinning down from that great songwriter's circle in the sky. A local photographer captures some spectacular images of a seagull being attacked by an eagle here at Kitty Bitty Lake. How the seagull escapes may surprise you. That's coming up.
program. First, we start with breaking news. Temperatures are dropping into the minus single digits. Time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes. It is just packed with people. The company says it's picking up salmon. Looks like an absolutely gorgeous afternoon. Welcome back. We all know that plastic bags are bad for the environment. That's why the provincial government plans to ban them this year. But a local photographer saw firsthand how dangerous bags can be when he came across a seagull fighting for its life. We're about to show you the photographs. Michael Windsor took the images uh, may be hard for some people to see, but the story does have a happy ending for the seagull anyways. I spoke with photographer Michael Windsor this afternoon here yesterday uh, just taking some pictures of the birds and it was not really happening. I was standing looking for bald eagles and so I went down to the bottom of the pond and when I was down there I saw this thing fly in and I thought it was a drone first because it was long, had, like, it was white and black so I kept looking at it. When I got closer I noticed it was a seagull. So then I actually uh, you know took out the camera fast as I could <laughs> to get some pictures of it. In the picture you can see like just the, the seagull and the big black bag was just kind of flowing behind. I was almost acting like a parachute, so I felt bad for the guy, so I figured I'd come up here to see if I could help him get the bag off or something. Out of nowhere, I didn't expect a, a juvenile bald eagle to start chasing him, because <laughs> I guess he thought it was a free lunch, right, unfortunately. The bald eagle actually had the talons right into the seagull, and I figured it was over at that point. But the ironic thing is, is that when he hit the water, the bag actually fell out with water, and this would kind of save them in the long run because the bald eagle couldn't uh, lift the seagull and the bag full of water. Like if it was an older or a sick kind of uh, gall, you don't understand, but due to our trash, it was in that predicament, right? So, you know, it felt bad. So when he got away, I was pretty excited over that. <laughs> I guess the bag, it saved him in the end, but it's what made him vulnerable in the beginning. Oh, for sure. And there's so many too of this uh, type of stuff that happens that we don't see. Fortunately, we had a happy ending because at the end, the seagull actually got the bag off his leg and flew away. Did the gull seem okay when everything ended and it got the, the bag off its foot? Oh, for sure. It flew away and I was pretty happy, I'd say. <laughs> and, and, and the bald eagles on the edge of the ice just looking at it and looking up as he flew away, the deep chase him, right? Just letting go, which was great. But again, when it comes to plastic bags, that plastic bag still went through the river and down to the ocean. And so the next turtle or a fish or something, right, is going to be there for years. So, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. So that's why it's great for uh, such things of, you know, recycling and all the major stores are doing it now, which is great. Yeah, and that story was great. Mm -hmm. Wow, Carolyn, nicely done. I mean, what a drama. And what a perfect right? day from the, uh From the Nature Channel or Discovery or whatever. <laughs> Certainly and was, uh, yeah. that to plastic bag thing, that ban's coming in effect fairly soon, I think, the problem's July. fine in July, yep. the summer anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming the seagulls have two minds of that now. <laughs> On the one hand, didn't like getting stuck. On the other hand, maybe it stopped the eagle from having its way. That's Anyhow, right. from Kitty Vitty to Harbour, Maine, Chapels Cove, Lakeview, where the beach there is now looking like something of a war zone. So much so, it's actually applied for disaster relief. Storm surges that Ashley told you about at the time. All of this during January's blizzard tore up the beach, wiping out one whole side of it and tearing a nearby storm drain and culvert right out of the ground. Yeah, engineers estimate that the repairs will cost nearly a million dollars, and the mayor says that that's the town's entire budget for a year. All right. Just off to the background here uh, is where uh, used to be a road there that went out to our Chapels Cove slipway and now you can see that road is completely gone. There's no means whatsoever to access that road to that slipway. It's been completely removed. And then if you just look off to the other side here, you'll see that uh, over here it's completely eroded uh, away the shoreline there. We don't have protection there. If it continues to erode underneath Point Road, under Point Road is where we recently just put in water and sewer lines. So that's a really big risk uh, for our community that uh, we really need to get some controls in here. So obviously a fairly serious situation there, right? With yeah, what happened there? yeah, it definitely yeah. is. That beach in Chapels Cove faces northeast, and so that okay. famous uh, nor'easter we've always been talking about when it hit in January obviously hit really hard. Very so. hard. Yeah. All right, we'll see. Maybe the province will step in and help them out. No doubt we'll hear more about that story. But let's move on to the weather. Yes. Wowzers, what a day. What Again. A day. Two for two. It was gorgeous. It's spring. I left today. I was golf like, is just around the corner. It, it certainly feels like it. Well, maybe some snow golf. Don't get too excited. Uh, I mean, my, my backyard still has three to four feet of snow in it. I don't know about yeah. yours. Hard to find the ball, but it can still be fun. 
It could be fun, certainly. Uh, yes, temperatures were absolutely gorgeous today. Let's take a look at uh, what we saw. Uh, showing four degrees in St. John's, but numerous areas on the Avalon were showing temperatures between seven and eight degrees. Same for Corner Brook as well. Uh, 8.6, I believe, was uh, recorded in some of the private stations there, but overall temperatures absolutely gorgeous today. And uh, we did see a temperature drop though, now that that sun is uh, going down. Three degrees in St. John's, one in Cornerbrook, and still sitting around minus nine for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So if we take a look at the current satellite and radar, we are seeing some cloud cover move in, and that's ahead of our next system. We talked about it yesterday, and if I zoom out a little bit, you can see it is uh, affecting Nova Scotia PEI right now. But none of the models are really handling this precipitation very well, so it's going to head our way. But just what happens at this point is a little bit up for discussion. So if we take a look, you can see uh, this model is showing that rain uh, across Nova Scotia. And it's going to head our way as we head through the overnight tonight. Looks like it'll bring some snow starting in the Beeren Peninsula after midnight tonight and then head towards eastern Newfoundland as we head through the early morning hours and into the morning commute. So we could have some snow on the ground uh, by the time you leave for tomorrow morning. Things could be fairly slippery. Uh, those winds are going to stay light though overnight tonight. We're looking at temperatures dipping into those minus single digits, hence why we're going to see that snow. And then up through Labrador, uh, some flurries possible for Lab West. That's going to clear out and then we've got a, a fairly nice night for the rest of you minus 17 but cold minus 17 for Happy Valley Goose Bay Cartwright sitting at the same thing with generally light winds. So if we take a look at what uh, that system will do through the afternoon it moves through pretty quickly at least it looks like it will and then in behind that we'll see some clearing skies certainly along the southwest that's the best chance of seeing that sunshine otherwise a generally cloudy day might see a few flurries now note that onshore flow along the northeast we could see some freezing drizzle as well even though it's not being picked up by the models and some flurries possible uh, anywhere really along the northeast and the northern peninsula so generally a gray day very different than what we're going to see today much cooler temperatures as well and then up through Labrador, quiet, maybe a few flurries along the coast and then southeastern Labrador. But otherwise, uh, you're looking at some sunshine and uh, some cooler temperatures as well through the day tomorrow. So if we take a look at just how much snow is possible with this one, uh, quite, quite a range in what the models are saying. So at this point, this is my best guess. And uh, it's looking at about two to five centimeters of snow. Areas on the uh, southeast may see five to 10 centimeters if this forecast verifies. And then flurries, like I mentioned, all along uh, the northeast mixed in with some freezing drizzle at times tomorrow, certainly for the northern peninsula, may get as far south as Corner Brook through the afternoon. So here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise. Quite a different story, dropping by three, four, five degrees. Uh, but those winds will stay generally light. So four degrees uh, will be the afternoon high for Marystown as you head towards central minus two minus four for Twillingate again in those onshore flow uh, onshore winds. And then the best chance, like I said, of sunshine will be down through the south temperatures reaching two, three degrees above zero and then up through the northern peninsula into those minus single digits. Minus double digits for Cartwright. Sunshine tomorrow, minus 12. And then as we head towards the west, those temperatures dipping again into the minus 20s for Nain, minus 14 for Lab City with plenty of sunshine. And it looks like some quiet weather will continue for you. And then as we head towards the weekend, the next weather maker will move in and I'll have all those details coming up. My next guest brought down a budget in which she got rid of 50 hospitals and she says if we don't act now, Newfoundland might face that kind of choice. Stay tuned for an interview with Janice McKinnon.
Well, so much attention on how difficult our provincial situation is, but not so long ago, there was another province facing severe consequences of overspending and debt, and that was Saskatchewan. There will be very serious uh, reductions of programs. I've rather used a gruesome term, amputations. Former Premier Roy Romano would admit that his province was on the brink of bankruptcy in early 1993. And at that time, Romano also said he thought it was a race between Saskatchewan and Newfoundland to see who would hit the bottom first. And one of the people responsible for getting Saskatchewan back on the right track is our next guest. Janice McKinnon was that province's finance minister at the time. The government has no choice, no choice, but to tackle the deficit of the province. Was Janice McKinnon in 1993. Today, she's in St. John's. The Employers' Council brought her here to offer some advice to our province. Uh, welcome to Here and Now. Great to be here. So, as you likely know, Newfoundland Labrador's debt uh, is a problem, and we now spend more money on uh, interest payments than on education. Spending is a problem. Sound familiar? Totally familiar. <laughs> Yeah. What was the situation like that you faced in Saskatchewan? Oh, well, we were, we were at, at a crisis. We were to the point that we couldn't borrow money. We had trouble borrowing money. And I think one of my messages to people in Newfoundland is if you get to that point, you're, you lose control over your own decisions. The credit rating agency said, look, here's the level of deficit you can have. This year, next year, if it goes beyond that, we won't lend you money. And so Newfoundland is getting to that point, but it's not here yet. And so it should, the, the government should be taking the measures now, restructuring programs, delivering programs differently, have an economic development plan to grow the economy and keep people here and to pay for the programs of the aging population. They should be doing that now to avoid the crisis that we were in. Okay, and, and some people might not know this, but in 93, there was a secret meeting with Don Mazankowski, then federal finance minister between you and him. Later, Roy Romano would go on to say that you were meeting to actually discuss a bailout. Is a bailout something that Newfoundland has to resign itself to? No, and we didn't get a bailout. They just changed a formula to give us a few, few dollars here and there. What, what they can't get is a bailout from uh, the federal government. People here, I know, talk about a bailout from the federal government. They would be the same. Any money that would come from the federal government would be on the same terms as the rating agencies. Get your fiscal house in order. Right. And uh, we Meaning? Uh, start cutting spending and, and cut it dramatically. Because when you say the federal government, you're saying to taxpayers in Ontario, you know, in Newfoundland, you have lower tuition than we do in Ontario. You spend more in many programs like health care per, per capita than we do in Ontario. But we, and the taxpayers of Ontario, are supposed to send our money to Ottawa to bail you out. Mm -hmm. so it's it a hard political sell, right? Yeah, no, so it won't happen it, without strict terms that means cutting spending. And, and in that sense, uh, that debate occurred in Saskatchewan. Our premier said, in no way are we allowing the federal government to tell us what to do. We'll right. do it ourselves. Now, part of your message is we should not allow our government, regardless of their political yeah. stripe, to, to let us sleepwalk into, into a crisis. Could you, what does that mean? Okay, so you're, you're, because you have a big deficit in debt, each and every year it gets worse, right? The deficit goes up, interest payments go up, you have less money to spend, so you have to higher deficit. You're on a downward cycle. And if, if you don't stop it, somebody's going to come and say, you have two years, and then you have to cut dramatically. We closed 50 hospitals in one budget. You did? Yes. And 50? You yes. You have to raise taxes quickly. So you have some time here to begin that process. For example, health care. Newfoundland spends per person $1,000 more than the Canadian average on health care. a lot. Yeah, a lot of reasons, too. You could have... 31 acute care hospitals, far too many, too expensive. Most expensive place to any, have any procedure performed is a hospital. You should be doing using acute care hospitals less. So make those changes now so you can phase them in. Otherwise, you'll make those changes. One day, half of your hospitals will be gone. Very, very sobering message. Uh, really appreciate you coming by. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. A lot for us to think about. Okay. Take care. Thanks. We'll turn to national news now. Ongoing rail disruptions have brought Canada's agriculture sector to a troubling tipping point. That's according to grain growers as well as pork and chicken farmers. They say their reliability as producers depends on train shipments and they're calling on the federal government to end the uncertainty. We have nothing to do with this dispute. The widespread collateral damage of these protests is grinding our entire industry to a halt.
and is taking a massive toll on farmers across the country. Robinson says the toll in terms of farmers' mental health and financial insecurity is high. She says grain farmers alone are losing $63 million a week because of contract penalties and new delayed shipping fees. She says with the transportation system frozen, Canada is approaching an animal welfare crisis because farmers are running short of the supplies they need to heat barns and feed their livestock. The response from people has been fantastic and uh, we couldn't have asked for a better start. Business is booming at the new Tor Bakery. We'll take you on a trip. Welcome back. From the bakeries of Berlin to Torbay, the town is trying to attract more businesses to set up shop there. Peter Hogan returned home to give it a go, but as Jeremy Eaton discovered, this isn't your Nan's three bun bread. Torbay is growing really fast. There's a lot of young families here and there aren't a lot of businesses, there aren't a lot of place to eat. It seemed like Torbay really needed this as the next step in its development. In my mid-twenties, I needed to pay rent, and they were looking for an apprentice at the Georgetown Bakery, and I was really intrigued. The hours sounded really bad, but I wanted to see behind that curtain and see what the world was like, and I loved it. My partner Molly was living in Berlin, and I wanted to be close to her, and I also wanted some uh, different experiences, experience some different bakeries, um, and so I moved over there. I was there for three and a half, four years, and I worked at a German bakery, uh, a Danish bakery, an Italian bakery, and the Georgetown bakery is a French bakery, so I got the, the full spread of the continent. I've been here for about half an hour looking at what you're making. This isn't Nan's bread. Can you talk a little bit about the style of bread and what sort of products you're offering here at the Tor Bakery? French and Italian bread with some sweets, focaccia, which is an Italian flatbread, we do uh, a savory version and a sweet version. And we also offer some sweets, some brownies, some cookies, and we're hoping to add pastries and more products in the future. The response from people has been fantastic and uh, we couldn't have asked for a better start. What do you think it means 
for the community of Torbay and the surrounding areas, Flat Rock, Pooch Cove, St. Phillips, Portugal Cove, Logan Bay, Outer Cove, Middle Cove, to have a place like this. So now you don't have to drive downtown to Georgetown, you can come here. What do you think this means for the community? I think it's great that there's, there's more things that people don't have to commute to town. They can get more products and more services here in this, in this area, which is a really beautiful area. And hopefully it also it attracts people from town. The East Coast Trail is just nearby. It is really a charming area. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. You know what I like about a day like today, at least in St. John's, because I can't speak for the whole province. Mm -hmm. Driving around, you can see people who really want to chisel every last bit of ice off their driveway. <laughs> Have you noticed that? In the sunshine, some people like in t-shirts, think, eh, I'm getting rid of you. It's true, and it's a great time to do it. Yeah. It's the roads are getting a little better, which is nice. That's true. That's true. And my sunroof was open uh, today Show while I was off. driving around. We nice. had to. Let's take advantage of it. Absolutely. The sun the feels sunshine. lovely. Excellent. So we're going to look ahead to Thursday? We are. Yeah. All right. We're going to uh, look at Thursday. So let's take a look at the future tracker. We've got a, an area of high pressure up through Labrador, which is going to keep things quiet overnight Wednesday into Thursday morning. That's going to sink a little south, which means Thursday actually looks pretty nice for the first half of the day. And then you'll notice that area of snow and pink, which is mixed precipitation, making its way through uh, the maritime provinces. That's gonna head our way as we head into the early morning hours on Friday. So this is our next weather maker. But uh, again, that first half of Thursday looks pretty nice. Lots of plenty of sunshine and temperatures in the teens up through Labrador. Uh, minus teens rather and then uh, minus three for corner brook so those temperatures are dropping and again it's because of that ridge of high pressure pulling that colder air with it and uh, marystown looking at about minus five port of basque minus two and those flurries will move in towards the evening hours now as that continues to track a little uh, over newfoundland at this point it looks like most of us will be in the cold uh, section of that so that means snow through the day the avalon Depending on how far north this tracks, we may see some mixing uh, for the southeastern portion of the Avalon. Otherwise, this does look like it could be a 
10 to 20 centimeter range uh, as far as that snowfall goes. There are areas uh, specifically for the northeast or the Great Northern Peninsula that might see more than that. So we'll certainly keep an eye on that forecast as far as amounts go as we get a little bit closer uh, into Saturday. By the time Saturday rolls around, we're still going to hang on to that chance of flurries. It does look unsettled for the most part, but by uh, Sunday evening again, this is a little bit up for debate because one model is showing another snowstorm and the other or at least another round of snow and uh, other models are so showing some sunshine. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on over the next couple of days. As we head into Monday, we're looking at another ridge of high pressure moving in, which means we'll see some sunshine potentially. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise. Uh, there's that drop on Thursday and then back up around the zero degree mark by the time Friday rolls around. Have flurries in there pretty much through Saturday. I'm saying sunshine for Sunday, probably optimistic, but I'll definitely keep an eye on that forecast uh, and a temperature near minus two. Heading towards uh, central Newfoundland, we're going to see temperatures hovering anywhere from minus one to minus two uh, as we head towards the weekend with the uh, flurry activity generally continuing, maybe a few peaks of sun and then uh, pretty much the same thing for western Newfoundland with a temperature near about into the minus single digits by the time the weekend rolls around. For eastern Labrador, sunshine for Thursday, then flurries right through Saturday and then uh, temperatures are rebounding nicely into those minus single digits. And same thing for Western Labrador, uh, minus 13 for Friday and then minus nine by the time Saturday rolls around. Well, we had plenty of sunshine. Wow. Isn't that cool? It's like coconut cookies floating around in the bay. Coconut <laughs> ice cookies, yes, exactly. That's something. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back. And we will be back in a little bit, but first some more news, some serious news for you. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal activities in Canada and one of the most damaging. Its victims, mostly women, often underage. Survivors and police right across the country are stepping up efforts to combat it. And as the CBC's Iona Romiliotis says, the hotel industry is being enlisted in the fight. So those are some things that front desk staff can look out for. The warning signs are stark when you know them. One of the biggest things is actually refusing housekeeping. So, you know, constantly having that do not disturb sign on. Another huge one is a major demand for a lot of towels and new bedding. At a Hilton hotel in Ajax, Ontario, staff are learning how to spot the signs of human trafficking and what they can do to disrupt it. If it's an emergency, call 911. But the best thing that you can do is just be kind enough to this individual. The majority of human trafficking occurs in hotels. Police operations like this one in Durham region are about making contact with potential victims. The vast majority are young, often underage and female, manipulated and coerced into the sex trade. It's why victim services of Durham region tell hotel staff victims often can't speak freely or seem disoriented. I was trafficked all the way from Ottawa to Toronto. Samantha Banducci was trafficked by her boyfriend. She says even just a kind word from a hotel employee would have been helpful. And I think that those things are helpful, not necessarily getting in somebody's face, but kind of standing in the background just saying, I'm here if you need me. Scene two, beta, take two, mark. Raising awareness is a priority in Durham. A public service announcement was recently produced and is now online. And beyond the region, Hospital emergency rooms across the country are training frontline staff to identify victims. So are truckers in the U.S. and Canada who may spot victims at rest stops. 911. As for hotels, several chains are also boosting in-house training as the demand for accountability grows. Lawyers claim that several local hotels helped sex traffickers. In, in the U.S., control. dozens of lawsuits have been filed against hotels for turning a blind eye and profiting from human trafficking. In Durham, police and victim services say hotels are a key partner and the majority are on board. Workers here say they're glad to know more. All the other staff here, we are all over the hotel. So there's things that we see that we don't really recognize or understand. And how does this change that? It's an eye opener. And knowing what to look for is the first line of defense. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Ajax, Ontario. 
A former Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein was supposed to head to jail yesterday after he was convicted of rape and sexual assault, but instead he's in a New York hospital after experiencing heart palpitations and high blood pressure. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, some of the dozens of women over there who have accused him of harassment, rape and assault, they reflected today on what his conviction means. The CBC's Stephen D'Souza has the latest. When Harvey Weinstein was convicted yesterday in a New York courtroom of a criminal sexual act and rape in the third degree, it was a moment that many of his accusers never thought that they would see. There are, of course, more than 80, up to 100 women who have accused Harvey Weinstein of sexual misconduct, but many of them have never seen their charges go to trial because of statutes of limitations or for other reasons. So a group of them gathered today in Los Angeles to offer their thoughts, and they say, while this is a moment they never thought would happen, it's also a watershed moment for their movement. This verdict should serve as an example so that all survivors will be heard and believed and so that all predators will be served justice. We may never know how many women have been assaulted by Harvey Weinstein and other predators of his kind, but I want yesterday's verdict to be a beacon of hope for all those intent on sharing their truth as well as those that may doubt their power to come forward. Weinstein is facing anywhere from five to up to 25 years in prison. And many of the women who spoke today hope that this is a new day, that this shows that the justice system is shifting to align more with society's evolving views on what's tolerated when it comes to sexual misconduct. This was never about Harvey. This was about what we, as a society, will tolerate. And I, for one, am glad that the message is clear. Hurt other people and there will be consequences. Your power and money will not protect you. The women who spoke today admit that there is still a long way to go, that the justice system as it's set up now re-traumatizes women, making them relive what happened to them when they speak with police, with lawyers, and when they go through a trial. But for each woman who spoke today, they say that the verdict was incredibly personal for each of them. In my mind, I am no longer trapped in a hotel room with Harvey Weinstein forever because I am here now with all these fierce women after his rape conviction, standing here reflecting on the irony that he will be the one who now feels the fear of being trapped. Today's news conference took place in Los Angeles where Harvey Weinstein is also facing charges for alleged attacks against two women. Meanwhile, here in New York, Harvey Weinstein will be back in court on March 11th for sentencing, and his lawyers have said they will appeal. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York.
Well, a great hockey story. Another day of celebration for Zamboni driver turned hockey star David Ayers. An incredible story on Saturday. He subbed in, as I think many people watching know, as an emergency goalie and helped the Carolina Hurricanes defeat the Toronto Maple Leafs of all teams. Yeah, and since then, it's been non-stop interviews and TV appearances for the 42-year-old from Whitby, Ontario. We had a great show for you tonight, and oh, ow! Oh, God, I pulled my hamstring. I don't think I can finish the monologue. Don't worry, Steven. I got you. David Ayers. <laughs> Zamboni hockey heroes. David Ayers, everybody. <laughs> so Ayers showed up on the late show with Stephen Colbert last night. Tonight, he's in Raleigh, North Carolina, home of the Hurricanes, where the mayor has declared it David Ayers Day. Yeah, he'll be at the Hurricanes game tonight. He'll be sounding the goal siren. Yep. Yeah. What a night that was. Wow. <laughs> Called in, helped uh, helped Carolina beat Toronto, and uh, normally the uh, Zamboni driver. <laughs> Just what an incredible story! That's so amazing. Yep. <laughs> he let in a couple, then he stopped everything. So there you go. Pretty amazing. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, shall we go back to the picture? Yeah, there now, it is. Can you explain what those formations are? It's just uh, I'm, ice I'm looking for like Latin sort of scientific no. terminology. Ice capped rocks. Ice capped rocks. That's what they are in Westville. <laughs> Very nice. I like that. Don't you like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Edgar uh, Blackwood shared that uh, wonderful photo with us. Lovely. Yep. What a uh, lot of blue skies. Just makes me so happy. It's white. Thank yeah. you, Edgar. Yeah, thank you so much. They do you look like, like Christmas cookies of some kind. They though, do. Right? You were right. I like the coconut uh, theory. Must be a hunger this time of night. <laughs> Dinner uh, time. Thank Supper you so time. much for exactly. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again uh, tomorrow. Good night. It was a great show.